Um, as everyone's getting onto the stage, I just want to give a quick introduction about what we're going to talk about. As Remy said, we're talking about the G in ESG and co corporate governance, and specifically how diverse and inclusive teams are going to make better decisions, they make faster decisions, and they deliver better results. And since we have someone from EY on our panel, Tony, I pulled some of EY's diversity and inclusion plan statistics to give us a sense of exactly what this can do for your company. So diverse and inclusive cultures are 70% better in, in new markets. They're 57% better at collaboration. They're 45% more likely to improve market share. And they're 19% better at retention. So with me are three leaders who have experience in building corporate cultures who are inclusive. Uh, they're gonna talk with us about how you do that and then how you show those results and deliver that to investors. Uh, so Seema, I wanna start with you. You spent years working at hedge funds. You were the CIO of the New York City Retirement Systems. Now you're founder and chair of Girls Who Invest. And I think from your experience, you got to the top, you worked your way up in the financial world and looked around and realized there were not a lot of women there with you. Um, so when you, when you had that realization, did you think it was a pipeline issue or it was a cultural issue? Uh, well, thanks for having me. So when I sat in the seat as chief investment officer for New York City's pension funds, we were managing at the time $160 billion. And when you manage that much money, you pretty much get every investment manager in the world who wants to manage New York City's money to come meet with you. So what happened was I sat down with all of them, and every time I got to their organizational charts and their presentations, I'd look down on it and say to them, oh my god, you guys, where are all the women on your investment team? I knew there were few women, particularly those that look like me, in my neck of the woods. So I spent the majority of my career in the private sector before I did my public service at the city of New York. So I've been a long only equity investor, a long short equity investor, uh, big mutual fund companies, big hedge funds, managed my own hedge fund. Uh, and so I knew that there weren't that many of us there, but I didn't realize how bad it was everywhere until I was in that seat. So private equity, real estate, infrastructure investing, fixed income investing. And every time I asked the question, why is this the case, um, I got the answer that Seema, the reason why is because we don't get resumes from women. And I thought, OK, maybe that's true. Maybe we do have a pipeline problem. And let's talk about that. We can fix that. But I'd also like to have the other part of the conversation. No judging, no blaming. But there are still firms out there in our business that have cultures that are not so welcoming to women. So let's have that conversation, too, because if we can tackle it from both ends, we'll make a lot more progress a lot faster. I think we all agree. We've all read the research that more gender diverse teams get better outcomes. So clearly, why wouldn't you want to have the most diverse perspectives around the table when you're trying to make these really hard investment decisions? They all said, absolutely, Seema. We just can't find them. So then any keynote I ever made or any panel I was ever on, and there will be hundreds of managers out there, I look at all of them and I say, OK. You guys, we have a serious problem in our industry. You tell me you can't find the women, so I will make you a deal. I'll go find them, and then you hire them. And they looked at me and said, what? And I said, yes, that's the deal. I'll go find them, and then you hire them. So I leave the job. It's a four-year uh, gig. It's a political cycle. Um, and I wrote an op-ed article, which Bloomberg published in September 2014. And in that, I just talked about the issues, the challenges, but what can we do about it? So as far as the pipeline goes, I suggest this idea, why not have something called Girls Who Invest? And we can build this massive pipeline of amazingly talented young women. We'll go to high schools, we'll go to colleges, and then we'll train them, mentor them, prepare them, educate them, stay with them throughout their careers. They'll become more senior, and they'll help change all the cultures. And then I thought it was done. But there you go. Uh, here I am, three plus years later, started a nonprofit called Girls Who Invest, having never done this before in my life, with a 10-page business plan and a really great board. And uh, what we've done is created this college summer program. We put nearly 200 women through this program in three years. It's a four-week educational part of the program and then a six-week paid internship at a leading asset management firm around the world. And then we've added online programs. We've added another two to 300 women that have gone through our online programs. These women are not only getting great jobs in asset management the following summer, the one after that, and full time, but they're getting four and five offers. So it's very exciting what we're doing. I'm very encouraged by our industry. Just this summer, we put 100 women through this program. Those 100 internships paid, by the way, in the beginning. I had to twist a few arms, but that's OK. Um, 
represented 66 unique firms around the world. So I'm very encouraged by our industry uh, with this. I'm very encouraged by the leadership of our industry. Uh, and they're just super talented women. So it's, it's a pipeline thing, I believe, yes. Um, but we're also now becoming a very big part of the conversation about cultures mm -hmm. uh, that Unless exist inside of these I want to bring Peggy in on that, for sure, because part of it is, like you said, building this talent pool. Part of it then is attracting the talent pool. And, and Peggy, you've worked in corporate governance at major companies, Sara Lee, Pfizer, JP Morgan. Now you're at Prudential Financial, where you're the chief governance officer. Um, one of the benefits of inclusive culture is it attracts great talent. Uh, and you've said that one of the reasons that you went to Prudential was because of that culture. Tell us more about how you attract it. And absolutely. You know, it's interesting, you know, mentoring college students, and I have three daughters, um, talking to them, um, and, and even a, a nephew who is looking at colleges. And I talked about culture, and he looked at me like, culture? Uh, you know. It was football or my coursework, or I said, no, culture. And, and, and the, maybe the older I got, the wiser I got. And I realized going to a place that really wants you, that's going to value you, that's going to develop you, that's going to focus on the talent, um, that's going to listen to the innovation, um, that's, that's going to excite you is so important and so critical. And having a diverse culture, having a, a culture where there are different ideas and people are coming from different perspectives, um, it's been proven that you are going to get a better decision. You know, one of the facts that really did attract me to Prudential is not only the senior executives, it was the people I knew who worked there, but it was the board. Um, right now, Prudential's board, uh, the outside directors, 80% are diverse. And if you take a look at the full board, including the internal directors, uh, over two-thirds are diverse. And I knew many of those directors, and I admired many of those directors and their leaders. So when I had the opportunity to go to Prudential, I knew so much about it. And I just said, wow, this is really exciting. It's a great place to work. And it's a, it's a place that, that you know they are really valuing you for what you bring to the table. So Tony, if you are a company that does not have a culture, like Prudential has not um, made this a big emphasis, how can you begin to build an inclusive culture? No, that's a, that's a, a good question and really a, you know, a, a hard one to, to tackle. Um, you know, in, in most of the work that I do, we do uh, help clients that are going through some type of transformation, whether the impetus of that transformation is uh, a transaction where they're putting two companies together or they need to go into new markets or they just need to change the face of their workforce, we always start with that leadership team. And whether or not that leadership team has a clear sense of purpose, whether or not they can articulate that purpose, <laughs> and whether or not they really have the behavioral anchors in place that allow other folks in the organization to then see what it means to walk the walk and talk the talk. So most of the times when we're in these organizations and that, that culture does not exist, we always start at the top. But that's not where you stop, right? You start at the top and you make sure those folks are aligned, make sure that everyone understands what they need to do. We put uh, interventions in place and then you start the cascading process. And it is a long and arduous process where you're getting all the other leadership teams aligned. You're making sure that all the reward systems actually benefit the, or the folks in the organization that do the right things and are to the detriment of the folks that don't, which is really important. A lot of folks, they, they think about these talent management systems and the, the ways we prop up these culture, and it's all about the carrot but it's as much about the stick as it, about, as it is about the carrot. So we, we, we try to put in place a system that actually supports not only the behaviors at the top of the house, but also gives folks a support of those behaviors all the way through the organization. You know, one thing Tony mentioned that I wanted to talk about, because our senior leaders and our board, when they looked at um, the diversity of our senior executives, um, it's good, but they, they want to get better. And they were trying to figure out, so they actually, the board implemented something that was very unique, and I haven't found any other company that has done this. They put a long-term plan in place, and if you keep the same percentage of diversity with your senior executives, you actually lose 
of 5% of this long-term award. You have three years. Um, so that's just, you know, staying in place. If you do worse, it's 10% less. However, if you do better up to a scale, you can get 10% more. And this is really, this affects the senior executives. Again, it's an experiment. I haven't heard of anyone else that does it. It brings the whole senior team together. It's not just my team, my department. It's really looking at this from a whole company. And it just reminded me what you said, Tony. You start at the top, um, you know, you have a carrot, you have a stick, it's long-term compensation, but it, 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 it brings it to top to mind, and it's long-term. So it's sustainable, it's not once and done. Uh, we all thought of, of the same quote when we were thinking about how to describe diversity and inclusion, um, and that's that di diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. So Peggy, tell us more about how you make sure that diverse employees aren't just hired, but they're given the environment in which to thrive. Again, it's part of the culture. You know, you, you think of the time that you just felt really engaged and, ex and excited. It, it's putting your own talent to work. So I think it's really, it, it's a responsibility of the company, it's a responsibility of managers, really to develop their team uh, and, and include them and develop them. And, and you know, and, and I think the better companies, you are actually graded on that. You are evaluated on your team through, you know, em, employee opinion surveys. But, but I, I go back to the studies that have all been done. If you have an inclusive environment um, that is diverse, you're going to get better results. It's going to take a longer time, no doubt about that. So the meetings, you know, add 10 or 20 more minutes because there's going to be debate, but you're going to get the better dis uh, perspective. But to get that debate, you have to listen and you have to include your, your, your you know, everyone on your team. So that to me is, is what I think of. You, you can, you, it reminds me of a story, my youngest daughter is physically diverse. So we were going and you know, applying for the schools and she did not use a pencil. And you know, a lot of the schools would give her a pencil to write her answers when she was like in nursery school. And she said, I can't use a pencil. And the girl next to her said, I can't, I don't know how to spell your name, but I can use a pencil. And my daughter said, well, let's work together. And you know, I think they had actually had that on videotape, and you know, 15 years later, they still use it. But that's an inclusive culture, which is you take the skills and talents of your team, and you collaborate, and you combine them. And I, I tell you, I think one plus one is a lot more than two if you can do that. Seema, I want to bring you in on this because finance is, is an industry that's really struggled in this area. Uh, we actually had an article on the Bloomberg Terminal this morning about how the Me Too movement is actually leading to more gender segregation in finance. Um, there's challenges with the, the cocktail hour and dinner mentality and you know, approach that this industry has taken. Um, can you tell us more about how you're both working with senior leaders on changing their perceptions and, and how they're thinking about whether their industry needs to change? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's true in finance. There's, uh, well, it's in any sector, really, we're, we're starting to see issues. But I have heard that um, there are, in certain situations, men who are now more afraid to hire women, to mentor them, uh, because these situations can get uncomfortable, they can be misinterpreted. Um, you know, the, the way I look at this is, and I've always approached it this way since starting Girls Who Invest and having these conversations with a lot of the senior leadership in our industry, is to me, um, this is just women and men sitting around a table trying to figure this out. You know, and it's hard, and I get it, and it's uncomfortable. Um, but we do a lot of hard things in our industry, so why can't we figure this out too? And so, you know, some of the examples I give about inclusive cultures are some of my own personal experience in my career so far, and without naming names, of course. Um, there are certain situations, as you mentioned, where in our business, business happens at cocktail hour and at dinners. And again, you get a senior man, you get a less senior woman. In many cases, uh, the man's married, the woman's not. Uh, that could be uncomfortable, and so here you are, this company throws an event, and there's business to be done. And so typically then what tends to happen is when it is uncomfortable, the woman stays at home. Now who does that do a disservice to her? 
So these are the opportunities for promotional opportunities, for growth opportunities. You get to know people socially. There becomes you know, trust and loyalty built in some of these interactions. And then you tend to lose out on that. And uh, so one of the best examples that I talk about is when I joined the city of New York in the pension fund. So when I joined, I was not CIO. I joined Larry Schloss, who was then chief investment officer. And uh, in terms of starts from the top, the tone starts from the top, absolutely. Larry set the tone, and it was a great tone. So I was head of public equities and hedge funds at the time. That was, call it 65 billion out of the 100 billion in assets was you know, me and my team. And so that was a big chunk of the portfolio. Uh, and what Larry did was, is you know, he and I used to have dinner once a quarter. And what did we do? We talked about the portfolio. We talked about the portfolio. We talked about our trustees. We talked about the board meetings. We talked about hiring. Uh, we talked about turning around the performance. How do we do that? Hiring people, adding asset classes, you know, that kind of stuff. Larry happened to be married, and I'm not. Well, that could have been potentially perceived as, oh, what are they doing? They're going out to dinner. But you know what? Larry set the tone. So what did he do? He said, you know what? I'm going to have dinner with Seema once a quarter. I'm going to have dinner with you once a quarter, you once a quarter, and you once a quarter. That set the tone. So as we went about our business, which is all we were doing, uh, you know, I worked hard. I think I earned it. I'm a talented investor. When Larry went back to the private sector, I became the chief investment officer. It became a natural, let's tap Seema because, well, you know, she's really good. But in those meetings, I mean, I learned, Larry's a very successful private equity investor. I learned all about private equity. He learned about public equities and hedge funds from me. I mean, we had this great relationship. We learned a lot together. We did all the asset allocation discussions together. I knew all that so that when it came time to pick the next CIO, he went to me, right? That didn't just happen. <laughs> so I give him a lot of credit for doing that. And that's just one simple example about creating that kind of culture and where the tone does start at the top. And so what I say to a lot of people today who have that feeling, and a lot of men who have that feeling in our industry is, look, I'm sorry you have that feeling, but we need to get over it. Uh, and we need to figure out ways to make these kinds of interactions not only happen, but happen in a really productive way. And, and what I've seen, which is similar to what Larry did, right, is where the CEO or the, the head of the firm goes to his team, goes to his senior men, and says, OK, you got to do this, and maybe we're going to dock your compensation if you don't do it. And in our industry, my god, we, I was a head of research. I was global head of research at Fidelity's institutional business in Boston before I did my public service. So I was responsible for creating compensation methodologies. And so, you know, in our business, one of the great things about it, and why I tell more women you should come into it is it's it's way more objective than not, right? So, it's performance. It did you you know, beat your benchmark or not? Did you make money for your investors or not? But there's still a little piece of your compensation that's subjective. And that's when all the other stuff can happen, right? And while it's a smaller piece of the overall compensation, it's still a piece. So why don't we, as leaders in this business, put in there mentoring? And if you don't mentor, and if you don't you know, promote certain people on your team, then not only do you have to say, you know, I promoted these person rather than these people, but why? Why did you not promote those people? Why are we not you know, compensating on some of this? And so, because that's what we do in our industry. So these are just some of the conversations that you know, we've been having, which is mm -hmm. good. And I think we just need to have more and more of these conversations. Because again, yeah, it's uncomfortable. I get it. It's human nature. But we got to figure this right. out. Right. The solution is not to avoid it, but it's to set the right tone. I want to take questions from the audience. But first, I have one last question for Peggy. I want to talk about how you're reporting to investors on Inclusivity Act. Um, efforts and specifically what questions should investors be asking you? Sure, you know, c certainly, um, and, and, and again, one of the reasons why I was so attracted to Prudential is, is they let us do things, for example, um, disclose things in the proxy statement that are just not legal requirements. That these were really things that after talking to our investors, and we do a tremendous amount of engagement. And the interesting thing is our investors ask about these types of things, not only yeah. our board, but they ask, and particularly now, every, uh, almost every meeting I go to, and I generally go with a board member, um, they talk about culture. You know, how can you evaluate your culture? How do you know if something is, is wrong? And so the answer is they, they, mm -hmm. they, they, want, they, they want information on that. They wanted information, for example, on our board. Um, and what's important to the board, you know, what, 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 
uh, you know, the diversity of the board. What are they focusing on? For example, because of that, we have a letter from our board in our proxy statement. It's not legally required. It's something the board wants to do to the investors to say, this is what we accomplished this year. We have videos that we put on our website and we put in the proxy statement talking about <coughs> culture, talking about diversity, talking about really what's very important to the board. So those are just a few of the ways we, we have information on our website, but those are a few of the ways that we try to communicate because investors are asking, and particularly after some of the uh, events of the last couple of years, they really want to know how do you have a sense of the culture and, and how do you keep in touch with that? Meg, what's, what questions do we have from the audience? That was one, but I can ask it to the rest of the group. Um, how can investment firms engage companies on diversity and inclusion, even in cases where the firm itself has a lot of work to do? Tony, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think just a, a couple a couple points. So I do think it's important um, to kind of keep diversity and inclusion together. Um, you know, one specific way com com uh, companies can engage is to ask their client companies, what are the metrics? Not only what the metrics are, but what specifically are they doing to obtain the metrics or close the gaps between where they are and where they want to be. Some specifics around that. Um, just a, another quick point around the inclusion part, and, and uh, Seema alluded to this, but I, I think it's imperative that folks actually go beyond what they're, act, what they're doing and what they're comfortable with. The opposite of inclusion is actually feeling isolated. And if you have diversity, and then those folks that you get in the organization that are diverse feel isolated, they'll leave, and that'll be even a bigger detriment than you, than you had when you started. So I think you really need to have metrics that uh, those folks ask their clients for and get a little bit under the numbers. Similar to that question for you, Seema. Um, the, we have, sorry, I lost my <laughs> place. The pipeline is building and culture is better, but women still don't stay. How can we keep girls, women in the game? Yes, that is true. Um, well, one of the things that I'm hopeful of is with girls who invest on the pipeline side, we're gonna flood the system, <laughs> <laughs> right? So. You put more of them in, and, and as these cultures evolve, hopefully, that, that they'll stay longer. We'll help them with that. Uh, but then they have a sense of community already amongst themselves. Right? One of the most beautiful things, makes me so proud, and I get tears in my eyes when I think about it, is I watch our young women, and I watch how they help each other, they back each other up, they support each other. You know, One of the things I say to them is, what the guys do really well in our business is they do business together. And we don't, you know? And I'm trying to fix that with the new investment fund that I started called Seven Step Capital, which is to invest in women alternative managers who want to start their own funds, who want to start their own businesses. Because it's hard for anyone to raise capital, but it's especially hard for women to raise capital. It just unfortunately is, and so I'm trying to address that too. But, um, but it's this notion that, you know, there's, there's not a lot. When you don't see a lot of other women around, and you don't see them that many you know, at the top, you start to wonder and think to yourself, well, shoot, how am I ever going to get there if I don't see any women up there? Or, you know, I see all that woman leave, and I saw her leave, and, well, shoot, I mean, everybody gets kicked around, knocked around, kicked in the gut, and well, that's just how it is, right? But if you go through that, and then you don't have a pal to go out with, and say, hey, let's go for a beer. You had a bad day. Just come back and go back again the next day. If you don't have that, it's really difficult. Okay. You know, I agree with what Seema said, but I'm going to be very practical because that was something 20 years ago I said, you know, why are we not keeping women? And I think you have to analyze it. Yeah, I think you have to have a more flexible work environment. Mm -hmm. You look at balance, women, and families. And so I think you have to change your own rules in addition to everything that that Seema said. I think you have to really look at yourself. If you're losing um, any group, um, you know, be it an age group, be it an ethnic group, be it a gender group, you've got to really, you know, you've got to really ask yourself the hard questions. Why look at exit interviews and try to correct that? I mean, you know, one of the things I'm so proud of, and I was just talking with my team today, 
is the flexibility we give people in order to, um, you know, take time off or, you know, devote to other types of things because people are an investment. And I'm sure Tony will tell you that. <laughs> and you want to keep that investment. That internal reflection is a good place to leave it. Please join me in thanking Seema, Tony, and Peggy.